You have to identify what it is and you have to feel it. One of the other things you focus on is, is developing leaders. Even strong people need to feel that you care about them, but you gotta find what works for you. Sometimes you just need to say, that won't work. You hit the nail on the head. Hello friends, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Success Factor. I'm the host, Trent Christensen. In this episode, I had the opportunity to interview Jeannie Moravitz. She is an amazing individual. She has had a lot of uh, years, experience, entire careers around human capital, human uh, resources, working her way up to several executive level positions. Now she is coaching others on how to drive greater human connection. She's a strategist around that, certified one actually, and also how to shift and improve mindset, leadership. Um, she's a trainer. She helps with HR consultation. Essentially, her motto is be the leader you would follow. And she's all about connection. She speaks real. She tells you how it is. She doesn't fluff and she doesn't bluff. She is a straight shooter, someone I really enjoyed interviewing. We connected on several fronts, even had some follow up conversations with her. It was like talking to a friend. Um, so I hope you enjoy this episode. She certainly inspired me to do better, and I learned a lot about her success criteria, factors, and how she, um, you know, becomes successful, and and how she has become successful in her life so far. Um, it was a really good, insightful interview for me, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for your support on the Success Factor. Have a good one. Now you're in San Diego. I am. Now you relocated from L.A. to San Diego. I did. I really relocated in 1989 to finish my undergrad at San Diego State and had real no reason to go back to LA. I mean, I go for visit weddings, funerals, those type of things, but yeah, yeah. I love San Diego. Once I moved here, it made no sense to go live there again. Although, wow. although when I grew up in the eighties in LA, it was the place to be. So it was, I, I don't regret one moment of it. It was amazing. But I did my time. So San Diego is, it doesn't get better than this. Are you from like the actual LA? Like what part of LA? Because I'm from Corona, if you know where okay. that's at. Yeah, yeah. No, I do know where Corona is. So I was born in Burbank, which is northeast of downtown LA. Okay. Um, and I lived in a town called Tahunga. And what is fascinating is I was speaking with someone else this morning about their podcast. And she's like, just random out of the blue. She's like, my mom lives in Tahunga. And I go, no way. No one can even say that name, Tahunga. So um, yeah, small world, but um, northeast of downtown LA. Cool. Very small world. Yeah. I was, I, Tahunga, I've never even heard of, and I'm yeah. from Southern California. Yeah. And that's... That's You've probably a, heard of La Cursena, La Cañada. I have. So then if you kept going along the base of the foothills, you'd hit Tahunga and then Sunland, Sun Valley, Van Nuys, um, all that area, the San Fernando Valley. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was fun. Um, all oh. we, we were just the, you know, we would just go over like Mahalan Drive and drop right into Hollywood. And so we, you know... Yes, underage would go down to the nightclubs and have just a grand time down there in Hollywood and and uh, different parts of LA. Yeah, that that's exactly what I used to do. I used to go and cruise what Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, um, go have some fun. That was high school time, you know. Uh, so I don't know. You might be much younger than me, but when I saw your name Trent, I couldn't help but think of Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. Are you familiar with that band? Oh. Of course, totally. <laughs> Not everyone is, but I'm still a fan. So yeah, yeah. I was a, I was into punk and industrial new wave stuff. That was really my my jam. That, that same with me. Well, I have a kind of a diverse music uh, palette, but punk. I I went through a punk phase for a while, Nine mm -hmm. Inch Nails phase for a while, um, rock, you know, hard rock, soft rock, classic, you know. But now I really enjoy more EDM type music. EDM. Which, yeah, electronic dance music. Okay, like okay. Fiesta, trance, trance type trance stuff. Music, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, trance is something I enjoy because it, you know, it just helps me like focus when I when I go out for a drive or a run or whatever and I'm trying to get something done and just hyper focus, it gets me into the zone much faster. And so I can hyper focus on what it is I'm doing. And the beats are something 
whatever it is psychologically, it just resonates with me much more than any other genre. But I still enjoy like, you know, Imagine Dragons. I take my kids to Imagine Dragons concerts mm-hmm. and I enjoy all kinds of other music still. Yeah, they used to tell me when, <clears throat> excuse me, when I got stressed out, they would say, you should listen to like classical music or something. I'm like, no, actually, they say you should listen to something that is beating stronger than your heart, not the other way around. And I thought that was kind of counterintuitive. But for me, it's punk rock. Like I will crank up some old school 80s punk and people are, they, it doesn't, like they look at me and they're like, seriously, that's what you listen to? Like they can't even put the two together because they see me as such a professional. Not that punk rock's not professional. That's what I try to tell them. So I'm pretty down to earth HR person who grew up in the hood in LA and, you know, <laughs> went to the Troubadour. And, you know, I was just thinking of like the Whiskey A Go Go, some of those clubs that I used to hit. And oh, yeah. That's awesome. The Odyssey. Yeah. Did you ever go to the Odyssey? Um, no, I've never been there. Yeah, I don't know. I think it burned down, so you'll never have a chance to go. There. I'll never be able to go. But I, I can't ever remember the names of the. I, re, you know, we would just go Friday night or Saturday night late, go hit up some clubs, and then get home really early. It wasn't a frequent thing for me. Um, I was more into like going down to the beach, having bonfires, oh good um, stuff like nice. that. But once in a while, we'd go hit up the clubs. It's a bit of a hike. You know, you were right there north Mm -hmm. of LA, but I, for me, it was a bit of a drive from Corona. Oh yeah. Yeah. You were quite inland. So I, um, I, you are not the typical HR executive HR consultant that I've spoken to, which is I think cool because you're more authentic and you're more like yourself and you're putting yourself out there, which is good. So that brings up my first question. What's your take on authenticity and how do we get more of it in the workplace? You know, um, great question. And people used to tell me, wow, you don't like shy from speaking the truth. And you know, that movie um, with Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. Like I would just say something like that. Like if I wanted to be an actress and, and pretend to be something on a regular basis, I would have done that. I was in LA. I could have, I could have found some role to play and some script to read but I am who I am. I'm going to show up this way. And it, people didn't quite know how to take me in the, you know, nineties and, and there, cause now look at 2020, everyone's talking authenticity and vulnerability and all of this. And I was kind of all that, always that, and I didn't always fit in. I mean, I fit in really well with the engineers and the creative team in the marketing department, but some of the executives were just like, who are you? But in the end of the day, they really valued my opinion. You know, at first they didn't know how to take me. And I remember this one of the CEO that I worked with, it took a couple of years for him to gain, um, for Tim Tim to totally hundred percent trust me. But when he did, he said, you know what, I'm not going to hire anyone in this organization until they've been through you. And that was like, I felt like I had one as an HR person, just showing up as myself, being totally a hundred, like whatever, we would have conversations like this during an interview. And I would find out way more about people and use my intuition to like, you know, give the thumbs up, yay or nay, whether we should hire them with valid reason, you know, oh, I learned I asked this question and this probing question, this probing question, and they told me this, I think we should avoid them, you know, or, or we should absolutely hire that person. I love the way that they problem solve. So I've always, I mean, I'm sure back in my high school days, there might've been days where I was trying to be something I wasn't before I actually grew up. You know, I can think of that, but in the workplace, I really tried to just be me. And did I fit in all the time? Absolutely not. They were like, you don't fit the mold. I go, that's the whole point. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't want to fit the mold. And then after, I think it was about 15 years, me working on a W-2 under, you know, different corporations. I'm like, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. And then I could do it my own way because I was losing sleep with some of the CEOs ways of running their business and what they're asking. Like, 
you know what? Sign off. You're the other signature person in the business. Sign off on this bonus for me. And I go, oh, but wait, before I have this whole list of other bonuses that were earned bonuses. Oh, no, we're going to skip those because you're going to sign off on mine. I'm like, oh, that's not cool. Yeah, you know? that's not that is cool. not cool. Leaders don't do that. You don't take away an MBO bonus that somebody's earned and is someone expecting it because they've achieved their goals to stuff your pockets. Like I had a hard time with stuff like that. So I would be like, what if I don't sign it? They're like, well, I'm instructing you to do it. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not cool. Like, why would you do that? You know, I would challenge so much. Right, right. And there was a time, not for necessarily doing that, not signing off on his bonus, but there was a time that um, I was told I didn't fit in and that I should look for another job. And I said, gladly, you know what? I will, because I don't. And it was, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I'll go find something way better. And that's when you started, that's when you started dynamism? Yeah. No, I actually found another, I started, that was when I got my first HR manager job was after okay. that incident. And then I started HRX in 2005 and I just did a rebrand last year. <clears throat> Gosh, I don't know what's going on with my throat. I just did a rebrand last year to Dynamism Leadership. Got it, it just, one day I was sitting at my computer and I'm like, I'm, I, HRX, HRX. It's just, I kind of like wanted something new and I had been functioning under the business for a good 16 years. And I, I, just discovered dynamism and somebody else had it. So I had to add leadership to it. Although that's my focus is leadership development. So when you are going back to when you were screening people and you were saying thumbs up, thumbs down, what were a couple of your big, like immediate deal breaker observations or cues that you would look for when you screen people? <clears throat> For me, I can read a bullshitter like it was no one's business. And so if they're living that life of faking it till they make it, it would shine right through their eyes. And so I would, I would identify them as they're not being honest. So I would, I would, you know, their resume looked great. They were really good salespeople, but I would just keep probing on what, wait a minute, that's not what you said a couple minutes ago. Cause I'm, I should have been an FBI agent to be able to be honest with you. I was telling my husband that the other day, I still wish I should have been an F I wish I would have gone to the FBI, but I would ask questions and then a true, like a, a real bullshitter doesn't even know where they, I hope I'm not being offensive with that. No, word. you're good. You can say okay. what you want. I we'll put, the, we'll put the little E next to the uh, episode. Okay. You're good. Keep going. Okay. So um, a, a true bullshitter just gets themselves caught up in this downward spiral. And it's really hard for them to get out with somebody yeah. who's really honest, a hundred percent, like I'm a hundred percent. What you see is what you get. If you want, if you ask me my, you're ask me my opinion, if the dress looks good on you, you better be <laughs> expecting to get like not just say it does you know i might there might be times if there's someone ultra sensitive i might say do you have something else you could try on and ask me that again <laughs> you know just to not hurt their feelings but i'm not going to say it looks good if it doesn't look good and i'm also that type of person who will tell you if you have broccoli in your teeth if your hair is out you know i'm the one who adjusts the other woman's crown before she goes on stage to make sure she's not you know all jacked up so that's me that's the type of person i am but i would i would ask probing questions to really get down to the root of it. And if I was questioning, hmm, God, he's really, he or she's really good um, salesperson. Yeah. Um, and we're not really hiring a salesperson, but they really want the job. Um, I'm just going to sit here until I figure out what it is about them that doesn't, um, isn't, really good fit for the organization. And there was only one, there was only one <clears throat> person who slipped through my cracks. I must've been like out of sync that day. And sure enough, the first 90 days, they were superstar 91st day. I'm like, Oh, that's it. That's what happened. That's where it was. So I missed the boat on that. So interesting. none of us are hundred percent perfect. Now, do you go into those meetings 
or even today when you sit down with folks and you have either consulting meetings or screening or talent type of discussions, do you look at things more of a, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have a preconceived notion about this person likely not fitting versus this person does fit at, but I'm going to figure out why they fit, why they don't fit. How do you go about it? Do you go about it positively, negatively, right out of the gate? What's your style there? I actually um, always have positive intent. That's my plan. So, so if somebody comes in, usually if we're going to interview them, for example, we would have a resume. So let me look at this and do my homework ahead of time or have someone on the staff do the homework ahead of time. How legit is this? Because anybody can create a marketing piece for themselves. And that okay. the screening process starts right then and there. And then usually there's a phone interview. And so you just start screening out because if you have 1,200 resumes, for example, you only really want to interview 10, how are you going to get there? So you start figuring out who is the best match knowledge, skills, and abilities for the job, right? And you're without even looking at the name or, or just what do they have? What do you need? But you can only figure that out by identifying the job, very clearly defining what would this person need to have to be successful in that job? Otherwise, you can't find the match. Yeah. It's like anything, yeah. even in any relationship. When I was, I was divorced and single, and I was like, you know, I kind of really want a partner. What do I want in a partner? What do I? So my, my, yeah. my best friend that used to go to these punk rock places with me, we sat down <laughs> at our age. Well, it's been 50, I've been married 15 years now, but we sat down and made a list you know, must haves flexibility lists on people. Right. And then we would like critique each other and like tear it apart. Like, come on, don't be so mean. And I'd scratch her <laughs> list out and vice versa. And so then you real, you know, what you, you know, when you find it, the same thing happens in employment, like, okay, this is exactly what I need. And this person who's going to fill this role, this is exactly the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they have to have in order to be successful. So now how do you match it? So I go in with positive intent that th these 10 people that we're going to interview, we've already done our homework. They should have everything that we, and now prove it. And I usually do behavioral-based interviewing questions. So it'll be something like, tell me about a time that you ran a department and what, you know, give me an example of one of your most stressful days or something like that. So it's always behavioral based, open ended questions that give you real answers. It's not like, so how did, no, did you like your previous job? Like you never ask a question that just leaves you with a yes, no answer. That doesn't give you anything. No, you got to ask the open ended. You got to be able to get them to talk about it and, and provide their experience and give you insight into how well it well it, it tells you a lot of information it tells you whether they were leading or a part of the team or a analyst on the team it gives you a a view of their leadership style yes of positions experience from that perspective but also demonstrate that they've gone through it authentically and they're not just bsing it and putting on a resume yes Those and are, also yeah. and even if they are the leader they should be able to identify different roles on their team mm. And that would tell me that they're a really good coach because they know the role. Now they're not going to know everything about it, but they should be able to identify those other roles on the team. And that would tell me that they're, they're more engaged than some that I have met. Some are like, yeah. well, I have a, I have a team member to do that. So they're super hands-off and most companies really need everyone to kind of be hands-on at certain, right. at different stages of the development or the, the company's growth. How, how do you think, um, how do you think the candidate screening process needs to change as it relates to a shift in just education and developing skill sets? For example, like udemy.com or Khan Academy or a lot of self help self go at your own pace type of programs where you can learn a lot of different skills out there through a variety of these platforms without going and getting the degree. Do you think that's shifting? How do we shift from a screening perspective so that we hire someone that is skilled regardless if it's a bachelor's master's or whatever? So I've always, um, it's actually, um, so I've always in it, actually, I've said both you, um, 
you you have to be able to prove that a college degree is required for someone to be successful on the job. And it's evolving more and more and more where it is not a require. It can't, you can't prove it. So to answer your question here in the now, how can you prove that my master's degree in HR is really going to prove that I'm better than someone else who doesn't have it and I'll be more successful on the job. That's really difficult to prove. So you, you can have it as a preferred, like I prefer that they have a college degree, but I can't require it. And so then that opens up to all these other courses, like tell me what you know. And that's even more important to ask those questions. Like, what do you know? And how'd you get that information? You know, did you, did you self-taught? I mean, think about some of these people who dropped out of Harvard, look at what they're doing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, not everybody is made out for college and college is not made out for everybody. And so, and it shouldn't have to be a requirement. I remember my, so I grew up in a family. We didn't have a whole lot of a family. I was the youngest of six. There wasn't a lot of money. My parents didn't promote uh, formal advanced education because they couldn't afford it. So they didn't like be like, okay, so in high school, what are you going to do in college? It was just like, my friends are all going to college and, and they'd be like, what school are you going to go to? I'm like, well, I think I'm done here. I think this is it. <laughs> And they're like, uh, wait a minute, we're going to this university and this university. I'm like, yeah, so that's not really an option for me because we don't really have money. And so um, then I remember my master's degree was actually paid for by a company, you know, and then it was like right that summer after high school, I went, I got this full-time job and this is, this is for listeners, like people are out to help you and you may not be, you might think they're out to get you. And I think this is, it, it was, it was um, very obvious to me in the eighties. Now, I don't know what it, I, I'm assuming you can still trust a lot of people now, but there I went to work for this full-time company in Burbank and it was an aerocraft aerospace company made parts for the, for the different aerospace companies. And they were like, so what school are you going to? I'm like, yep, same story. I'm just not, there's no money. I don't have, I don't know. And they would bring me applications and say, you need to fill this out. You have to go to Cal State San Marcos. So you, I'm not San Marcos, I'm just in San Diego, a Northridge, or you have to go. And I'm like, ah, uh, that wasn't really my plans. You know, I'm just going to work full time. They didn't take no for an answer. They ended up enrolling me in the junior college, which I ended up getting an associate's degree. So I was like, wow, people believe in me more than I believe in myself, or I didn't even know it was an option. Again, you know why I said parents didn't have any money. So um, I did that and made them very proud because I you know, did work full time and did my undergrad. And that's why, I'm, and then I moved to San Diego because I had a couple of friends who were like, look, we have a room for you. Here's the applications for San Diego State. And I was like, okay. So it was just like, sometimes we're being led and we don't even really realize it. And I look back on those people who believed in me and had more knowledge about higher education than I did. So I went for it. Then my mom was just like, you know what? They can't take it away from you. Education can't be taken away from you. So whether you get it at a formal university or not, um, I think learn. Learning is should be a lifelong thing. You know, we should never yeah. stop learning. You've never know enough, in my opinion. So I'm always doing a course or I'm working with someone or some, because I just, that's just who I am. And I think a lot of people, it would really benefit them to continually to take or read. I see a lot of, or is that a, I don't know if that's a regular backdrop or not, but it looks like you have a bunch of books back there. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So let me show you, this is my office and I will show you how crazy it is. I got the ability to change all these oh, lights. Oh, look at that. Um, solid Ooh. pink there. Let's see, I can go, what's this one? Arctic Aurora. Ooh. Uh, Placid. Uh, and then I, I usually have this type of mode on. Oh, it didn't change. Very high tech. I have this one on normally for recordings because it's more just like normal yeah. lighting. But I'm trying, I had someone ask me, well, why don't you change the lighting? 
you know, when you're recording and I'm like, that's a good point. I don't know why I don't do that. So I'm trying to change it up a little bit. I like it. I like but it. You were probably hinting at the degrees. I do have some degrees on the wall. Is that what you were going to say? Well, that, and you, it looks like you have a lot of books too. Like I'm just, I do, yeah. I do. I love to read. I love to get by books and some I've never read them. They're sitting on my books. <laughs> Same with me. I've got, half of those are read and half are waiting to be read, but they I will try, be read. <laughs> you will read them. You will read them. So to answer your question, I know that was a long story. I, I, I do believe in education. But you got to find what works for you. Everyone's yeah. different. And I, I saw something recently about trade schools and how we really need to like encourage people to do that if that's what they want to do. Because of course we need tradesmen. And Absolutely. so I, I find someone asked me earlier today about what, how I ended up in human resources. And what's interesting is apparently a lot of people switch a lot of their career several times in their lifetime. And I've spent 32 years in human resources. And they said, that's really rare to spend your entire life doing the same thing. And I said, well, when I moved to, from LA to San Diego to go to San Diego state, I was marketing was the thing to do. Marketing's cool. All the cool people are in the marketing department. I could not get any classes. They were all, they were all so impacted. And so I didn't want to be there forever so I went to the counselor and I asked her, well, where would, what classes would, the, what degree could I get with the majority of the classes that I finished already? And as that turned out, I only needed like one or two in public administration. I could get an undergrad in public administration. Mm -hmm. And I did an emphasis in human resources simply because in public administration, I got an opportunity to an internship at the city of Chula Vista in their HR department. Wow. And then... I had to take a couple classes and it came all of this. If there was like something clicked in those classes, like it wasn't like, it wasn't hard for me and it wasn't a challenge and it was no longer, Oh, I have to read this book. It's like, I get to read this book. And then I realized, so I've been in, my passion was developed because I couldn't get classes in marketing. I ended up finding my passion in human resources. And I've been riding this road ever since. I've, it's changed a little bit from being a W-2 employee and I climbed the corporate ladder, became a VP of HR, and then decided that really wasn't for me. And Do I we, then went I want to talk about that. <clears throat> I want yeah. to talk about what you just said. Yeah. Let's talk about the transition. Yeah. What led, what was the aha moment? What was it like transitioning? How did you go about it? So the aha moment was a long drawn out thing. And it was my very, one of my first couple of first jobs, corporate jobs was the, these cubicles, right? So you're sitting in a cubicle <clears throat> and every Monday morning you'd come in, good morning, happy Monday, every Friday night, have a great weekend. And I thought, this is the lamest thing <laughs> I've ever been involved in, in my life. Like I could, I was doing it and I was making the money and I would, you know, I was getting promoted but i'm like if that person tell but you know remember ally mcbeal that show i'd be like if that person says have a great weekend one more time i'm just gonna be like <laughs> oh my god so <clears throat> it was a long time coming because i'm like how can i change this like mm -hmm. i like what i do but how can i change this like where i have to show up at the same place every day and have the same parking space and you met the same person at the water cooler. And I'm like, oh. you know, it just really wasn't me. And I worked for a startup software company and a lot of the engineers were working from home. So I'd be like, can I work from home? And they're like, no, HR doesn't work from home. You have to be where the people are. It's funny because now look, you have to have a global pandemic for them to realize that yes, everyone can function at home. And even better, like, cost savings, more efficient, oh, uh, totally. better work-life balance, less stress. Ton Anyways, we'll go, we'll go there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there, there's actually a company I know of that's been functioning for 12 years, hundred percent remote, super mm. successful. So, um, I used to wonder like, what could I, could I do that? Could I do that? And I had this amazing, he was my financial advisor. He was an amazing man. Sadly, he passed away very early, like 57 years old. But he, oh. my father died in 1998. 
uh, by a drunk driver. And Joey, my buddy, Joey was my financial guy. He also, he became like a father figure in a way where he pushed me to try things that I didn't think were possible. So Joey was like, you know, Jeannie, why don't you just go out on your own? And I'm like, HR doesn't go out on your own. They're not allowed to work from home. You know, like I was just following the little, everything they told me He's like, why not? And he would challenge me in a way that my father probably would have, you know, like, why not? He would always like, I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. And so then he really encouraged me in 2005. I had an, I was our little software company here in San Diego, got bought out by a company in San Francisco. And about January, 2005, being high level in HR there, I had an opportunity to lay myself off or put myself on the list. So it was time. I pulled the trigger, eliminated my position and started my own business in 2005. And it was because- Did you give yourself I, a nice severance package? Yeah, I did. Of course <laughs> I did. <laughs> and, and Joey, you know, thinking, looking back, I really owe it to him for just kind of pushing me. So I think we all need somebody who challenges us, challenge, challenges those those assumptions and those thoughts and those things that keep us small and just why not, you know, find yeah. your why, like your passion and why you do things. And then ask yourself, why not you? Because you know what, if it's not you, someone else is going to do it. Someone else will do it. What was your first like offering? What were your first services? What did you offer companies in, you know, how did you, yeah. How did, what did Great. you start with? Yeah. So I, I, that severance, I told you, I got, I was taking a little bit of time off and I wanted to read all the books on my bookshelf. <laughs> and I got this phone call shortly after saying, um, our CEO has been told that they need to hire you as their HR person. And I was like, okay, that's like the best of all worlds for a, a consultant, right? I'm now a consultant. Yeah. The CEO needs to hire me. And it was only like a couple miles away. And so um, I went there. He did try to talk me into being a W2, like, why don't you just come on the payroll and be an employee? And I go, and it was so hard to say, I don't do that anymore. I'm a consultant. But I stuck to my goal and my plan and my reason for going out on my own and said, no, I'm a consultant. I'm no longer a W2. And that, that was hard. But when, when you commit to your goals, you stick to it because things will have 17 and a half years later, here we are, yeah. you know? And it's like, just know what you want. And if you're not there yet, work with somebody to help you get to determine exactly what you want, what's gonna light you up. What's, go, what's we laugh with some of us that like, what's your, what gets you out of bed? What gets you excited to do your day? Do those things. What sets your yep. soul on fire? And if you're not doing that, why not? You know, you know, that, that is sad because I hear that a lot and I hear that from colleagues. I hear that from friends, family. Um, I've done interviews with, you know, other, other guests and it's a similar, like it's a similar perspective. A lot of people don't do what they want to do. They do what they have done because they're skilled and experienced and they provide value that way to someone and but they don't go and pursue what they're generally interested in and passionate about and let it evolve however slow or however long and however successfully they, they just don't do it and some people don't even know what they're passionate about right they don't experiment right right i'm a true believer you need because you know what happens there's like whole studies on people sadly are i call it um uh, aging out mm. and they say their biggest regret is not doing what they wanted to do. They yeah. did what they have done, what they've made money at, what someone told them to do. I mean, there's, and there's a, a shift right now happening where people I've seen a lot in like attorneys, you know, my parents want to be, a, be an attorney and I hate it. I'm going to go do whatever they want to do now, right? So they're finally doing what they want to do, not what someone else wanted them to do. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest factor, and it might be playing a big role right now, is the financial aspect of it. Because they're so afraid to 
risk that? Like, how am I going to pay my mortgage for my family or what have you, right? So not everyone, everyone's positioned differently and everyone has their own financial issues. And so you, we don't know, you know, but well, if they could do it on part-time and start grooming to transition out and have a plan, that would be great too. You know, and, and I would argue that to, in today's world, we have so many more methods to earn money and it may not be a full-time job, right? But if you are in a job and you want to go and spend a little bit of money investing into a side business or something, and you need that extra income, today we have so many more options to make that extra income. So and many. The world has shifted that way. You can do a lot of contract work. You can go drive for Lyft or Uber or you know whatever, or v Veo, and you can make that extra income. Absolutely. And there's some, mo some of, well, I'm going to say most of the wealthiest people have five or six, seven different buckets of things going at one time. Mm -hmm. So why not? If you, if, so say if you are, my husband's a civil engineer and, you know, he's tired of sitting at the desk and writing. Oh, I shouldn't say that, huh? But he's, he is like, <laughs> we could edit that out or he won't even listen. Right. My he, wife doesn't. Well, it, it's listening. okay. <laughs> if he listens, I mean, I'm sure it's, it's hard for doing that for long, long periods of time. Yeah. And so say, if, say, if you're doing something and why not start this, like, like I was going to say like a hobby, but you don't want it to be a hobby. You really have to invest in it like a business if you want it to be successful. But like you said, why not start do a couple hours here at night? And there's so many things that so many things available. Yeah, there's a lot. You can monetize a lot of different things right now. I just saw there's actually a core. I'm, I was trying I think it was the University of Maryland. Maybe they have a course on being an entrepreneur in the metaverse. Wow. So I guess they're going to be wow. selling business inside. And so we're just learning this, right? This metaverse. So I saw this last night and I'm like, wow, okay. You know what you should do? What? I just had an idea. You should mirror that proactiveness and jump on that from a- Shh, Don't employee. say it. Don't tell the secret. I know where you're going. <laughs> There are some options for you to capitalize on that from an employee employer perspective that could evolve the virtual workplace. I'll say that high level. That's what I was thinking last night too. Yeah. But I it'll be probably four weeks before this even gets published. Maybe five. I have a bunch in the can that okay. I'm just waiting for. I publish once a week. So okay. I have a bunch more recorded than I, you know, like this won't be released next week. Yeah, yeah, so. perfect. But it gives you a good month. You could start to, you could start a website. You can start changing your branding. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's, I, I, that you, that's where you have to catch it, that, you know, before it starts to cap. Yeah, because it, things will continue to change and evolve. They, we're not, we're not going to plateau in technology. It just will change. It will evolve. And I think if you can ride that wave in any aspect and leverage your experience and your skill set, but also get a little bit of creativity in it. Oh man, you, anyone listening to this episode can do that to any aspect of life yeah. and capitalize on something. I agree. I agree. Yeah. It takes effort. It just takes trying. It, and it, yeah. And it takes, yes. And you have to be you have to, as an entrepreneur, you have to be self-motivated. There isn't going to be someone who's going to be, you know, giving you a performance review. You need to go for it and yeah. do get it done, you know? And so the first couple of years of my business, yeah, I was working around the clock. It didn't matter, but I loved it. I loved it. I wasn't like eight o'clock on a Monday morning and five o'clock mm -hmm. on a Friday afternoon. I, I always thought that was just so struck too structured you know so Jeannie, what is and you probably have heard this before but what is your genie in the bottle uh secret sauce to stay in business 17 hours or 17 years rather and why do people keep coming back to you what is your secret sauce what's let's take that genie out of the bottle and show your magic mm, i like that and no, no one's, uh, no, no one's asked me it like that. I remember saying, I remember people saying things about, I dream a genie when I was a, you know, a, a teen and stuff like that, that I thought was kind of corny, but I like what you just said. So for me, 
I say what I, 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 I advise my clients in a way where they can choose what they want to do. And then I do what I say I'm going to do, which I know a lot of people do, but I really do. And then I go the extra mile and I'm always available when I take a client in. It's like, what do you need? Absolutely. You know, why not? And then, and I, I can quickly problem solve. And with the experience that I have with so many, probably thousands and thousands of leaders, I want to say nothing's new when you're dealing in the human centric aspect of business, but that's not true. There's always something new because it's a new personality and a new day, yeah. a new moment. Yeah. You never know. So it's how I handle the situations and it's nothing like super new, super unique, but I have always treated everyone with dignity and respect. Everyone. And when people say, oh, you should you know, I've heard the saying so much, like you should know the janitor. I really did know the janitor and I treated him as good as I did the CEO. And there were people who came in with huge egos and they wanted me to roll a red carpet out and I would call them out. Like, we don't have any red carpets here. So I don't know why you're acting like that, right? So I'm just being me. That, that's my secret sauce is some people will love me and other people will hate me, but those who love me, actually really appreciate the fact that that's no nonsense. I will tell you like it is. And I will be the one to say, mm, um, so I'm the only one in the room saying this, but we're all thinking it just so you know, like, let's, let's stop pretending. And here's the facts. Let's, let's work on the facts in this way organizations streamline the process. They can be more successful. There's why just all that pol political stuff and red tape in businesses. Why? Yeah. Why? Just I, I, I want to summarize that all as saying you're real and you're authentic and you're not afraid to say what needs to be said. Thank you. And I think we have a shortage of that. We do. And it's hopefully changing, especially with more, you know, like podcast communications, you know, like, like people want real people want authenticity, right? The, some of the feedback I've received is uh, in my career, because I have a full time job too. And um, I have a career, I don't really talk about it in the podcast. This is my side hobby and passion. But um, people crave connection with their leaders, not the PR scripted canned answered yeah, answers or language. They want authenticity. And because of that, I've seen a rise in podcast style conversations occurring in and out of corporate America, um, more so developing now in corporate America, where people can really connect with like an executive over HR like yourself, and they can hear what they have to say, what they're thinking. There's no script. There's no PR canned answers. It's a real conversation. Yes. And people resonate much better with that than yes. at a town hall with, you know, standard answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was always one to say, we need to communicate communicate, communicate, right? And communicate the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And I used to have CEOs say, but we can't tell them that. And I'm like, why? Why? Yeah, why? why? You hired them. They're adults. They're educated. You, you, what do you mean you can't tell them? Believe it or not, if you tell them, they might help create a solution. What do you mean you don't tell them? Like they, they're not ready for that yet. They, they can't handle it. Remember that whole, you can't handle the truth. I'm like, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> So I'd be like, you know what? We need to tell them this now. Yeah. So that's how the cultures that I worked in, the companies I worked in, the cultures we created was just about no bullshit. Like we all, this is our mission. Here's our goals. This is who we are. This is what you need to do. If you go the extra mile, you're going to get this in addition to, and then we, we made it happen. There's yeah. this company in San Diego, the, com the startup that I spent seven and a half years at, that group of people are still friends. And we That's left cool. in 2003 and we're still friends because we were so real. And we, hi that's the one company that I work for that I was like, they're not going to fit in here. You know, mm. they're just not, they, they're not a true team player. 
and yeah. and you really want that you want somebody and i'll give you an example o'clock at night i packed up my office i'm ready to go home and the receptionist is stuffing envelopes and i'm like why are you still here well i got to finish these envelopes you know what i would do drop my stuff and help her finish the envelope so we could both leave that's cool. that is a true leader that is and that's the type of people that i wanted in the organizations that i worked for and that's what i look for in hiring anybody in the organization someone who's willing to to step in and help when it's needed on anything you know your team yeah and it, i think um a lot of people lose sight of that they get so focused on what they're over and their little real estate piece that they forget that that real estate piece is actually a piece of puzzle that is a bigger picture and all these other pieces come together and create the company and they forget and and you know there's bigger pieces that are sub components of the overall company like divisions or departments but a lot of people lose sight of that they just get focused on their little piece of real estate and they defend yeah. it you know they want to optimize it and create efficiencies but they don't talk to the other pieces adjacent to them or have impacts uh positive or negative yeah they don't they don't communicate a lot of times communication is the biggest issue in in businesses yeah and I just posted something the other day, communication isn't a barrier. It's the solution. It is the solution to everything. Talk about it. Don't be afraid to come in and speak your mind respectfully. That's it. It's, it's how you communicate. So you were talking about like one little function of the, the company and they, they don't communicate with the other departments. Back in, we had this exercise where we put up Every department was responsible for a list of goals within their department, but how they fed the other departments. And so in the lobby, well, it was kind of the inside lobby where everybody could see it. We would, and we, the head of the department would have to do a presentation on, we do this because it helps this function. We do this because it's supported by that function. So you can see how everybody works together. Mm. And so it didn't matter if you're in that, you can't have sales without marketing. You can't have, there's no point of having HR if there's no employees. Like, you know, it's just the whole, why, why do we do what we do? And we took the time to do that too. And, and it was posted up on the board. So you knew exactly what, what department was focusing on what. More people need to do that because, and when I was at Goldman Sachs back in the day, they would call that commercialized mindset so you have a commercial point of view you understand the business the marketing the revenue the client relationships the research and how they all work together into a cohesive product that the customers see and that develops your ability to think commercially right but uh, we don't we don't really focus on that in other companies mm -hmm. it, we we need to yeah, which brings absolutely. brings me to my next point so can we talk about training and development for a minute sure so you do, you offer training and development consulting. Um, yes. How has that shifted? Earlier on, we talked about like education and degrees and Udemy and Khan Academy and all these other resources popping up, which is great. I mean, you, in my opinion, Udemy is going to be the future of, you know, education. You, mm -hmm. You're going to have all kinds of skill sets come in there and offering curriculum certifications. And they're going to be experts like yourself in those fields offering that knowledge without a umbrella of a university, right? Yes. And so it's very freeing and it creates a uniform, like universal rather access point where anyone can go and do it. So how is your training and development kind of approach and strategy you work with your clients shifting as a result of that? So my, the, the offerings that I have as far as training, I, I have several different subjects so it could be something like um a coach as a leader or um emotional intelligence or communication and i would co-create with the ceo or the head of hr or the head of operations a solution using these different training programs so it could be something as small as a 45 minute webinar style. It could be half day. It could be a full day where we pull in certain pieces, depending on what the organization 
feels they need. So sometimes they don't know what they need. They might just say, look, we put a budget in for $1,200 per person per year. What can we get? And I would say, well, well, I'm not going to give you something you don't need. So let's talk about like what's lacking where, so if it lets, we could break down and that's where it gives me kind of a little bit more, um, what's the word for it? I would stand out because of my years of experience is I can say, is your sales department function like this? What about this? So they ask, and I can ask a lot of questions like how does customer service and what do we need? And then they say, bingo, I think this is what we, we just figured out what we're really lacking here. And so then there's several different, like I said, subjects, and then I customize them for their need. Hmm. Okay. What do you think is a common issue with companies dealing with employees? Like what is a common area they need to focus on? I know you mentioned emotional intelligence. I was thinking that may be one, but what are some other That's areas? huge. Emotional intelligence, um, trust. A lot of employees don't trust their leadership team. Why is that in your eyes? Because um, they haven't been honest with them. They haven't told them the whole truth. They may side, um, or like, that's, they call it side swipe, I guess, where um, all of a sudden they're laying these people off and nobody had any idea that the company was even doing bad. Like they don't, they don't believe that the leaders are being authentic. Mm. I've experienced this as an employee. As have I. It is an issue. It is a problem. Huge. How do you get Huge. around this? How do you, it, and one of the other things you focus on is, is developing leaders, right? Mm -hmm. How yeah. do you create better leaders? So how do you help address that in your approach to shape or refine or uh, educate a leader? So it's going to depend, like if it's a group, then um, we might focus on here's the nine different things that are really important. You have to have strong characteristics in to be a trusted leader. And it might be one-on-one. -on -one, tell me, how do you recognize your staff? Tell me about, you know, let's see, who do you have on your staff? Here's nine people. So we can sometimes get really close and talk about like, how are they interacting? What kind of connection do you have with Trent? Do you even know Trent outside of the office? Do you know that? And so this is when, when I was inside HR, I'd be like, do you realize that the reason he leaves every day at four is he has a son in the hospital that he needs to visit? Like, did you even know that? Like that makes a huge difference rather than, oh, he cuts out every day at four because he's going surfing, making that assumption, which this is kind of a true story. And so I, I'd be like, you you got to get to know your staff when you make that connection and they get to know you. So that means, you know, if you want them to be vulnerable and be honest and upfront with you, you have to be that same way with them. So show them who you are, you know, so they back to my days and, you know, they, the HR, they always said, God, you're like one of us. Cause if they came in and I was like, I don't know, I'd bring my dog to work or whatever, you know, I'd be like, she's, she's calms me down. Like things like that, that they got to know me. Like, Oh, you have a boxer. Why do you have a boxer? Well, do you know the characteristics of a boxer? Like ask these questions and it doesn't take a lot of time for people to just know something, but to ask and get to know something about someone. Hmm. It doesn't take a lot of time. And then no, like, how's your boxer? How's your son? I, I, I heard you got this cool car, whatever, right? Like just ask him. I had a, I had a director at one of my companies and I was working closely with him and I, and he's like, my staff doesn't like me. And I go, does your staff know you? And he's like, of course they do. I'm like, do they? So I would ask questions like that. And it really gets them thinking They're like, I guess they don't know me. I go, have you ever shared anything about yourself? Have you ever asked them about themselves? And so I would, I gave him some things to work on. And then he, one day he's like, oh my God, I'm having these conversations. They like smile at me. I go, you know why? Cause you're smiling at them. Cause he used to, he used to be on his phone walking to the restroom walk and just like walk right past them would never even talk to them. So wow. I encourage leaders take the time you hired these people, treat them like people. 
Yeah. Find out a little bit more about them. It's not just about the job. And when they come into your office for your one-on-ones, and if you're not having one-on-ones, start there. And first thing, before we get into the, the projects, you know, before we start talking about that, how are things with Mary? How's the dog? How, you know, whatever it is. Right. But be real and don't try to just be able, well, Jeannie told me I had to do this. Like, you know, I mean, you got to really genuinely care to get to know them. That makes all the difference. That totally does. Some leaders really struggle with this, like being able to be open and to share insight or details about who you are outside of work yeah. and the the leadership mantle and role that you have that's received and perceived by all your employees. Some people feel so uncomfortable stepping outside of that, let alone, you know, sitting down even in a one on one and and talking about non work related stuff. Yeah. which is very rare too. Most, most leaders don't do that. They, they focus on the tasks, the team, the future, where are we going with this project? We, but one-on-ones in my eyes should be that opportunity to really connect person to person and to see how it's working. How can I help you grow, learn, be happier, develop? Do you feel valued? Do you feel engaged? Do you feel like you belong here? How can I help you with that? That's something that leaders struggle with. And ask, what obstacles are you facing? What can I remove for you? Like I'm the leader. I run this department. What can I get out of your way so that you can shine? Yeah. You know, so that's business stuff. But yeah, take the and I'm not expecting people to spend hours chit chatting on the clock, you know, but just spend some time showing that you you're a human too and you want to know about them as a human. Yeah. You know, share information about you personally. And not everything, like as if from an HR perspective, I'd say, you know what, be careful when I say share all this information personal, because some people will share everything. I remember that too. <laughs> those are one of the like stories I could tell yeah. so many stories. I'm like, why are you talking about this right now? Like, this is not, this is off the table, right? But communicate, model the behavior that you want. So if you want people to share about them, you got to share about yourself too. Yeah. Show them you that do. you're real. You know what? And then show them that they have a growth path too. Like, you know, this is it. And if your staff doesn't know how you got to where you are, start there, you know, because they're probably yeah. wondering how to get in your role. So what did you do? And where were your failures? You know, that's one of the things I've, as I've led teams and worked with people and also just hearing other folks and other colleagues at different levels that's one of the things that is frustrating in a, an environment where you have many more positions at lower levels, but very few at the upper levels. And so not everyone is going to move up into those higher positions uh, for a variety of reasons, which we, you know, we don't need to get into that, but how do you help be real with employees about that and that it's okay if you don't move up next year or the year after that into the next promotion and there's only very few spots and it's hard to get highly competitive there's 15 other people in your level that want that spot so don't focus on that because you're setting yourself up for a letdown but yet focus on it if you know what i mean because you need to put your best foot forward to try to evolve, but how do you handle the psychology behind that to all those yeah. employees who are not going to move up? Well, you never know what's going to happen when that seat's going to open. You never know. So mm -hmm. it's in your best interest to prepare for that. And it might not be at that organization. So True. learn all you can with the, with the belief that you are going to move into that role, but you might have to move organizations to get in there. It depends yeah. on how many seats they have, like you said, if there's just one. But what you really want to do is, is learn all you can foundation in many positions. And then maybe, you know, then when there's this one role that oversees all those. So cross train, you know, if you feel like, you know, what, I've, I've mastered my role. And there's no place for me to go, but I really want to stay at the organization. See if you can cross train on another role at um, level with you. Mm -hmm. And see what that's like if you want to learn something else. Like, and that's really how now you're going to have even more um, knowledge to be ready for that role. Yeah. And then ask, really I, I cannot say this more, ask questions, ask yeah. questions of people in the role. How did you do that? Like inquire on how to, 
gain what you need to be the number one candidate to be asked to come into that role, to be promoted into it. Right, right. Yeah, because that's something that a lot of people don't ever ask. I mean, they don't make it known that that's what they want. And I want it so bad, I'm willing to do what it takes to get that. But what is it I need to do? Some people aren't, aren't even comfortable having that conversation. Well, they won't. And I've met so many people who are like, well, they didn't, they didn't promote me. What did yeah, you do? Mad, yeah. You kind of, you need to manage your own career. So I know I empower my leaders to ask their staff, like, where do you see yourself in three years? Where do you see yourself in five years? What are you going to do to get there? What can I do to help you get there? That so do you, you don't work with individuals, right? Or do, I do. do you? No, I do. Okay. So like someone like myself, who's, I don't know, mid, mid level manager or, you know, lower level leader wants to become the executive one day, but yeah. I don't know how to do it. Could someone like myself listening to this, call you up, engage you and have you help them to become a sharper executive? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I've done a lot of that. I've groomed, I've groomed a lot of people for their next role. Okay. Absolutely. That's cool. That's a good, because you, you don't only, you don't, you're not limited to just working for firms and companies. You work with the individuals too. Which and I really like cool. working with individuals. That's one of the, I have a nice diverse um, set of responsibilities on any given day. And I like it. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, are you, what, what's your future like? Are you going to wind this down? Are you going to do this until you die? What's your plan? I don't know, because part of me, you know, in 2020, I'm like, hmm, how can I retire? You know, given the, the, I, I was doing a lot of speaking engagements in 2018 and 2019. And when 2020 rolled around and everything shut down, all those things were canceled. And everyone told me, why aren't you pivoting? You should go online. Like there, you could just be, speak at the conference online and, and I had a son at home who is now at working, doing school from home. And my mom was in a nursing home and it was just like, I didn't pivot well in 2020. I just yeah. didn't. And that's okay. Cause I had other responsibilities that were calling my name. So now when I'm, I'm feeling super fresh and back and, and back in business and rolling and I've pivoted all I needed to pivot now. I don't see myself retiring anytime soon because I love what I do. And I, if I, I have learned so much over the years, whether it be from the way that my mom raised me, she literally could have been Brianne Brown and Simon Sinek combined if she had had the right resources. I'm not kidding you. So I That's had, cool. she planted all these seeds in me. And then when I read stuff in their books, I'm like, mom hello like she uh, this is and she passed away last in february of last year mm, sorry and, to hear that. you know thank you i know i was suddenly um and i i was uh i was an orphan like now i had no yeah. parents and that wow. was just like the strangest thing because you are really adulting like i thought i was adulting when i bought my first refrigerator or my like washer dryer set and then when i and i know that sounds funny but you you actually like, am I really buying like appliances? And then you're really adult when you lose both parents. You're like, yeah. you're out there on your own. So you're, you're in the world by yourself. Yep. You're in the world by yourself. So um, I love what I do. I see myself. So I have a staff of nine contractors who are spread out across the United States. So if business comes into me, I decide, am I going to do it? One of the, are, are one of the um, contractors available to take on the assignment? Mm -hmm. Who wants to do it? And I divvy it up. Where are we going to go with that? I see me doing a lot more speaking engagements, and that's how my business is going to cover my salary. And so I just feel spreading certain messages and information and sharing with a bigger crowd on stage would really be uh it's something that i really like and that i probably enjoy the most right now so mm -hmm. i will continue to do those things moving into 
the end of this year and next year. And so I can't see why that wouldn't continue. How, what are like, what are some of the things that help someone become a better speaker? I know that's something you help coaching on, or it's one of your services yeah. that you can advise clients on, but what, what are some tricks or tips that you have for someone who is looking to become a better public speaker and go out into the public and get some engagements? Yeah, there's, it's funny because this book, it's called Own the Microphone, and there was many um, speakers in it, but I did one section or one chapter, and I'm just going to tell you what it says. The very first thing says, jump in with both feet. So if you feel like you want to be a speaker, you should most definitely go for it. But what you need to do, and I mentioned this earlier in the conversation, don't fake it till you make it. Talk about something that you know that you've experienced. Tell your story. And I've actually met people who make stories up. And you know what? I'm a true believer. The truth will always prevail. It wow. may not happen that day, but the truth will prevail and you'll be shown up. Remember? Okay. So you remember that band that used to lip sync? Yes. Millie Vanilli. Millie Vanilli. Girl, you and, know, it's true. Ooh, yeah. When they ooh. came out, I was like, <laughs> I love they've been that. lip syncing. Like that is so ridiculous. Right. I so know. they became a laughing stock because they were fake. Yeah, they were fake. It so was just lip singing. Yeah. My, this chapter of this book said, it talks about being authentic, being you showing up, you know, get up on stage and if, if, in, and tell them how you're feeling. People relate and you want to be able to share with them something that they haven't thought of yet. That could very well, when they leave there, if they implement it, it could change their course. So, okay, that's amazing. What is, so the book is called Own the Microphone. It's called Own the Microphone. Bridget. I just, okay. it's Bridget McGowan. I just had one chapter in it. Okay. But, um, we, the book I really like, and I also did another chapter in this one, it's called Success Code Since Years of the Success Factor. Yeah. Secrets to Success You Weren't Taught in School. And this one, my chapter, it's an inside job, maximize your human potential. So if you have a burnt, we've talked about this. If you have a burning desire to do something, why are you not doing it? Because people are like, people are so unhappy at the end of the day. A lot of people, they come home, or same old job. Well, change it. Guess what? That's the one thing you can do in this change create the life you want yeah it's it is much easier than you realize it may be uncomfortable to step out of your comfort zone but as you do that a little bit at a time um you know you you evolve and you become something so different just a year or two years later and you're much much more primed to succeed in your passion because it, it, it takes change. It takes you doing something different, right? Yes. You can't just continue doing what you're doing, but expect a different outcome because that's the height of insanity. So you've yep. got to be that change, even if it's baby steps. Yeah, baby steps. That's what I say. How break things down to manageable chunks. So yeah. I'm in a, a trio and we call ourselves the we're accountability team. So every morning we text the three of us in a text group the three things that we're going to focus on today that's going to move the business forward. And we started with these grandioso things, right? And then you're letting yourself down. Break that down to something that is digestible and achievable that day. And then at yeah. the end of the day, you celebrate that win, however small it is. Break it down. Everything can be broken down to something that you can accomplish today. That so makes the big difference. And then, yeah. you know what? Just keep plugging away. Keep pedaling. And you'll get there. You'll get it figured out. And if you don't, if you're, if you're blocked, hire somebody who can help you ask, your, ask you those questions like, well, why didn't you? Like, hold you accountable. That's one of the best things about coaching is the accountability factor of it. Yeah. That's what we, I've enjoyed about We tend to let ourselves yeah. down, although I put that list out and they, they see it now, now that I let my other two accountability partners see it, now I have to do it. 
Yeah. They feel the same way. But if we just wrote it down, then guess what? You can change the date on your list and do it tomorrow. And right. then you don't feel good about yourself. So right. get an accountability partner, do the things, you know, if, if you're still trying to figure out what am I passionate about? I actually have a values assessment that I offer that tells a lot. There's two factors, two sides of it. One is how do you rate these things that are important to you in life, in life and now rate these things on how you're actually living them. And then I compare the differences and say, what's going on here? Right. That's so it could be, it could be something like, I actually have somebody's values assessment here. I won't share the details, but it could be something like family or flexibility or friendship or fulfillment, fun, something like that. And then you can see that they rated a five as being so important in their life, but they give it a two or a one that they're actually doing it. Why? What's key? Why, why do you think that is? What keeps people from doing it's confidence? Changes? It's usually confidence. They're afraid to fail. It could be something that when they were a child, their, their parents or whomever, or some role model told them, no, you're not good enough. That I, it breaks my heart. I actually get chills. Breaks my heart. To, I've heard that so many times. My mom told me I wasn't good enough. My dad told me I wasn't good enough. My dad told me I was too fat. I'm like, what the, who, what? Like, uh, my mom was my number one fan. She told me I could be president of the United States if I wanted to. She told me if you set your mind to something, you can achieve it. And you know what? It is totally doable. Everything. That's a really good point because I think there is some issues there that I've experienced and others have experienced. Parents don't know what it takes to really put forth the right effort today when the kids are young or growing up to have a lasting uh, impact positively into that child's life. And sometimes it's not because they are purposefully doing something wrong. They all, sometimes they don't know, or it's mm -hmm. omission. They don't know they need to be more involved. They don't know they need to go to those games or, you know, those activities and encourage the child, um, because the child needs to feel that they're validated and they're supported and that they matter because if the kid is just going and doing whatever activity or sport or hobby they're into when they're a youth at any age, but the parents are not engaged and they don't care, what does that tell the child that they don't matter, that that endeavor doesn't matter, that that discipline or, you know, uh, hobby or sport doesn't matter to them. So then the child will likely fade away on that. You hit the nail on the head. That is so huge. And I can tell you, I'm the youngest of six. So my siblings are very different from me. And so maybe it took my mom five, six tries, right? And you don't know what you don't know. And my mom used to tell me, some parents, they don't realize that when you become a parent, you take that parent pill and it's all about your child. You can't, you can't be selfish. Now, she didn't have a cell phone. So I'm going to say this for the modern parent. You can't be selfishly like this when your kid's playing baseball. They are watching you watch them to your point. And when your eye is on your phone, that's more important than them. I love what you said about them needing to feel validated. They need to feel like you care. They, they, there's yeah. so much to what you just said. And it's so true because that same child grows up with those same limiting beliefs. And, and that's it where it has them. to change. That's where it has to change. And, and parents don't know what the, it's really hard being a parent. Like, Oh yeah. I, I have actually, five kids. I know. <laughs> I thought like, I thought two-year-old and three-year-old was hard. Oh no. My son's going into middle school and I'm actually like more nervous and I'm trying to, so he doesn't hear me I'm more nervous about <laughs> this time. And I've lost more sleep, like thinking about this whole bullying thing and all this thing coming yeah. up that I'm like, Oh my God parenting is hard. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of resources out there. And I, I've read a lot of things like, have, I'm sure you've heard of Carol Dweck's mindset. Yes. I've heard of her and it's the mindset. My, I wish I had the book near me. It is so thrashed because I've read it. So it's called mindset and it's Carol Dweck. Um, amazing. And that's stuff that you should everybody should apply to themselves and their children. It's about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And really the words you use 
And you don't want to tell your children, you're so smart, you'll be fine. No, you want to actually acknowledge how they solve problems, right? There's the difference. Absolutely. It's so I highly difference. recommend that book. It's wonderful. It's a quick read. It was one of the, I, I, it's around here somewhere. I like dropped it in a pool. The whole thing is so thrashed, but I love it because it looks so lived. And it's, it's like, on Audible too, which is good for me because good. I love multitasking while I'm walking the dog or working out or yard nice. work or whatever. Or driving. Yeah, I get that. That one's gr- excellent. Um, Carol Dweck mindset. That's a good one. I've mm-hmm. actually not read this one, but I've heard of her and those concepts by yes. others. Recently. And, she, and she has a, several YouTube um, uh, videos that are quick and to kind of get the point across, but I've done presentations on her work and I think it's quite amazing, life-changing. So back to the child thing real quick. Yeah. I think there's, see, there's, there's a significant lesson to be learned at at a child level when your parents get involved or encourage you to continue trying something or doing something by supporting you, paying attention, listening to you, watching your recitals or, you know, your videos or whatever it is, because it, it tells the child that someone cares and they matter. And if you are distracted and you're not involved and you're not paying attention or you're just dropping them off and then leaving to go do something else because you're busy or whatever. Um, what you're telling the child is that it doesn't matter if I do this or not because no one really cares. And let's be honest in this world, no one really cares about you. You care about yourself. You need right. to care about yourself. Yes. You don't do it for other people, Yes. but you need to develop that. And in order to develop that, you need a parent to help you nurture that concept of you matter because you, you matter. matter in your, par- your, your parents' eyes. And ultimately that will lead to you mattering in your eyes. Oh, yes. I, I, there are certain things that like, it's, how do I describe it? Like, it gives me the chills. This just started like this last two years. And I wonder if it's since my mom passed, it's almost like, boom, she's like, yeah, girl, that's exactly it. <laughs> like, oh, I, I guarantee you, I is. feel it. I feel like, yeah. the, and like what you just said, she's connecting is, with you. You got some spiritual sensitivity going on. Oh, that's exactly. Cause it, it, you know what, Trent, I haven't thought about that. I'm like, why do I keep getting the chills? It's when things like this, that really, really touch my soul you just hit on something parent people who parents who listen to their children the same thing goes to leaders and organizations when you listen to your staff they feel like you care that they matter that what they have to say you know and and what they're doing makes a difference and you're teaching them how to care about themselves i love what you said i'll give you an example so i mentioned my dad passed away and mom passed away too so um when I was little, my dad, this will tell you how old I am, liked Star Trek, like the original Star Trek. Okay. And when I'd be like, daddy, daddy, like, look at this bottle of water. It's amazing. He'd be like, shh, shh, wait for the commercial. <clears throat> now my dad was fun. He took me to Magic Mountain all summer long. Like we had fun, but it was shh, wait, wait, wait for the commercial. My mom, hey, Jeannie, come here. What's going on? Talk to me any time until she couldn't at 88 until she could not like talk back like listen and have a conversation with me she was available for me 100 percent oh look she's like going yeah girl i sure was like she's giving me the chills That's um awesome. big difference that is huge and i've been thinking of doing this um course for self-confidence and um confidence and sharing all that I've learned and maybe it could be for parents who you know what it's not too late work with your kids they need you need to be there for them and uh, you know and put the put the screen down too many people are on screens you know your phone all the time yeah I, there was something like I had read, if your child brings you a rock, 
you keep that rock. That was so important. They thought of you to give you that gift. Like you, you don't have to keep it forever, but keep, you know, while they're young, put it on your desk. So they, they feel like, oh, I gave that to mommy or daddy, right? The same thing goes, if they have something to tell you, you drop and you listen, you drop what you're doing. Now I'm not saying if you're in the middle of like running your business, or something, but you know what, make it reasonable. Yeah. And another thing is like, maybe there's an hour every night that it's just for your child to spend time with you. And if you have more than one divide it up or however you do that, it's all your time, whatever you will need from me. Because when, when they come to you with questions and you're available, guess what happens when they're struggling? They're struggling in the you. teenage years. They're going to come yeah. to you because you were available. Even for the little things, you're going to be available for the big things. And don't judge them. Be there. And kids don't need friends. They have enough friends. They need you to be a leader. And they need you to help them through situations. Pull, them, pull their hand up out of the puddle. You know what I mean? Totally. It's huge. I love that. It's huge. You, you should do a program or a book or you should do a podcast channel on this. I think you should totally dive into this a little bit because it feels like since your mom has passed, you're re this is resonating with your huge. soul. Huge. It is. And I think you can leverage that energy, motivation, and passion and experience and put that forward for other people that are struggling. <sighs> And I have been thinking about this and for you to actually acknowledge it and see it. This is such a great conversation, Trent. <laughs> I'm glad we're having it. Yeah. You're really, you're really insightful. And I love how you just speak what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's who I am. And some, like it. I've always said, some people can't handle it. They don't know how <laughs> to deal with me. And even some <laughs> of the, some of the, my son's parents, like they, they don't, they, they will be like, oh no, they have plans or whatever. I'll be like, nope, he doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to go. Like, just yeah. like what's wrong with the truth. Yeah. People are so afraid. You know, I had this conversation with my neighbor last night, walking the dog. She goes, well, I would say this, this, and this. And I go, why? And I go, so maybe that's why they're doing this, this, and this, this is the problem. Nobody's communicating facts. Yeah. What's wrong with the facts? Like, you don't have to be a turd about it. I was going to say <laughs> asshole. <laughs> just, you can just say that. That's fine. <laughs> be respectful, but be like, think this is one thing I've learned over the years too. Like, no is a full sentence. No, period. Do you yeah, want to go is. somewhere? No, period. Right? No. <laughs> You, and, and a lot of women will go, no, because I got to do this, 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 no, no, thank you is perfect. And I always add thank you because no is kind of rude, but no, thank you. You don't have to give an explanation and it lets you off. Don't make up some bullshit story. Just tell them, no, thank you. I, people in the workplace and out of the workplace habitually do that. It's, you know, my wife, my kids, my friends, my family, uh, employees, bosses, Everyone does that. Sometimes you just need to say that won't work. That doesn't work for me. Nope, yeah. not going to work. But instead, they instead of saying that, they give this long rationale and justification why it doesn't work without even saying it doesn't work. Right, and you know why? Because they're uncomfortable. They feel they have to justify. And the beauty, if you start doing this, the first one will be a kind of weird and odd. The next one will get easier. It gets easier and easier and easier. And guess what? You are actually relieving stress from your body because you're not making shit up. <laughs> you, you're just, no, thank you. Like, do you want to go to dinner or you want to go to drinks on Friday? No, thank you. Yeah, Done. I'm busy. Sorry. Done. Right. You don't yeah. even have to say busy. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Maybe you know, another I'm, time will work. I'm Yeah, I'm giving everyone permission to just I say- love no, thank you. And it, it's, it's freeing. It see, I, it took me, I'm 41. It took me probably a good 39 and a half years to really understand the concept of embracing my vulnerability, authenticity, and saying no, and being confident in that and appreciating mm -hmm. me and having confidence in me to the point where I can say that doesn't work. And here's why, or Nope. I, no, thank you. Um, 
I think we're inherently people pleasers and our society is designed to help people become people pleasers. And, but it, you're sacrificing your confidence and the love for yourself at in that expense or yes. that is the expense or whatever. Yes. Um, and so we need to learn to be confident to mm. say, no, that doesn't work. No, I don't want to do that. Yes. I want to do that. Yes. This is what I want because you need to look out for yourself. Yes. And when you are putting other people in front of you, how can you possibly hundred percent care for yourself and love yourself? If you're willing to just like, I'll give you an example. I love your examples, by the way. My, thank you. My, I, I, my husband now we're going to be celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary. So we've been together 16 and a half years in uh, October. We're going to have a big party because we can. And, um, when I first met him, we would go to Christmas Eve at his mom's house. That was the tradition. And his sister-in-law would hand out these tickets with names on them. And you would have to buy that person a Christmas present. So the very first Christmas I go to this new Smith for Christmas, and I'm like, have to, have to buy a Christmas present. You have to buy a Christmas present. Why does this not sit with me? Why do you have to do anything at Christmas? Isn't it gift giving out of love? Like, who is this person on the ticket I have? And why does it tell me what I have to buy them? Like, it, and then my sister-in-law is just like, who the hell is that? <laughs> Who'd you bring to Christmas? And I said, you know what? Your idea, and I, you know, it's good for you guys. It doesn't work for me. So I'm either going to, to not be involved. Like nobody has to buy me a present. Don't to pull my name out. I don't want, it just doesn't feel right to have to. And by the way, the first year I actually went through with it. The second year I was dreading Christmas to go over there because I would, we would pull the card at Thanksgiving and then you'd have to buy. And the sister in law seriously, she would be like, this is my next door neighbor, Mary, and she wants a hundred dollar coffee maker with a twenty dollar pound of coffee. And I'm like, this is not Christmas to me. So what I the second Christmas, I said, why don't I want to propose something at Thanksgiving? And I hope nobody's going to be offended. But um, the whole gift giving thing with this group, it wasn't working for me. So I'm just going to throw an idea out there. You tell me what you think. I go, what if we adopt a family and we take all those hundred dollar coffee makers that we were forced to buy the neighbor? And um, why don't we, we supply a family in need with gifts and clothes and think money that they need and maybe a, a Christmas dinner? Like of all these, you know, cause there's like 10 of us, that's a thousand dollars. Everybody put their hundred bucks towards, we're going to adopt this family. They love the, love the idea. That's and cool. I didn't, I didn't do it because I wanted credit for the idea. I simply yeah, yeah. did not want to be told what to do <laughs> and <laughs> who I had to buy a present for. Do you know what I'm saying? See, I think that is amazing because there's value in being a nonconformist and question authority and question the status quo. And you embrace your confidence and vulnerability and authenticity by challenging that, disrupting it and creating something even better that everyone else participating in and going along with it would have never thought of. And and the reality, they might have thought of it, but they were they didn't want to just like knock over the apple cart or whatever that saying is like disrupt yeah. the apple cart or whatever. And I'm like, I have never just complied for the sake of doing it. We're not doing it this way just because we always did. And this is what I love. I'm calling them the youngers that are coming into the work world. Now they're like, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. It doesn't and challenge it. And I encourage you to challenge it. But the cool, yeah. there's something really cool about the youngers right now is they're not take, they're not putting up with it. They're like, uh, no, I, I, do, I don't know why we do that. And why are you talking to me like that? <laughs> like it's, yeah. they expect to be treated well. And I give them yeah. credit, a lot of Good credit. We have a lot, some of us that have been in the work world a long time have a lot to learn. Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, it, I mean, even people going into trainings, they're like, why are we going through 60 slides on PowerPoint and having one person speak in a mundane voice? Why are we not using animation, cartoons, breakouts? You know, why are, there's different ways to learn. This is so totally. boring. Totally. I love <laughs> you know who it. you remind me of? Who? It took me an hour and a half to figure this out. 
but I finally dialed it in. You remind me of Meryl Streep. Oh, is that good? Yeah. Okay. You cool. know the actress, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Your personality mirrors her character form in almost any movie she's in. Oh, you, wow. You come across just like her with your kind of say what you want type of question things, your reactions and mannerisms. <laughs> like you, you do have a lot of Meryl Streep going on. That's like cool. It. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> You are much younger than her, though. I will give you that. <laughs> I don't. How old is she now? I have no idea. I just looked up. Here, let me go back to that tab. Okay, she was born in. Oh, so she's seventy three. Yeah, you're much. Okay, younger. yeah, yeah, much, much younger. So, so the, yeah, I've been on a lot of podcasts over the last year or two. Th this was the most enjoyable. Wow! Thank you. That yes. is a really good compliment. Yes. I appreciate that. Great conversation. What I love is you know what you're talking about too. Oh, thanks. And you ask some great to... questions. And you, when, when I was really listening to what you're saying, and when it really touches me, like I call it, like in my soul. And I love what mm. you said. Like it is your mom connecting with you, and that I just figured that out. That that's why I'm getting the chills. It's her like sending down some sparks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you are really see. I love. I love the authentic, vulnerable, speak your mind type of personality, and you have that going on. And so I, I, I appreciate that. But it's easier to talk to you too because I can focus on what you're saying and not in the back of my head go, okay, this is just BS. You know, she's just marketing ploy, whatever. Um, I, I actually get engaged and I think about what you're saying and. I just hyper focus on those type of conversations. So that's one of the things I, one of the reasons why I really enjoy doing this podcast. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. What a good Thank conversation. You. And um, my grandfather died two years ago. And after he died, I started to have a lot of weird things happen. And it took me probably a good eight months to realize it was him. Mm. And so that's why I so cool. recognize that in you because it's, I don't understand it. I mean, uh, you know, we don't need to go down the religious card, but spiritualism is real. And when you have a close person who goes on and leaves this world, um, a lot of times you can connect with them or they connect with you because they're probably thinking about you too, wherever they are. And sometimes it happens right after or close to their death. And so that's why I picked up on that. Yeah, that's really cool. He got me thinking about so many things from this last con this conversation for the last hour and a half. Oh, um, and also he was trying to get me to do some things differently. And oh. I didn't realize that. And I finally was meditating, pondering, kind of trying to connect with the energy and the positivity and the love I was feeling. And then it all, it took probably eight months, but it finally hit me and it finally helped me shape my perspectives and some things I needed to do differently your mom could be like trying to help you out too, you know, I maybe so. helping nudge you in some areas where you can maybe even impact more people than you have today and help so many other people that may be struggling. And it could be them as a parent role. Maybe you can really leverage that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're onto something. Yeah. I did. I, I was on her. I, she hasn't published it yet, but there was a podcast and she specifically asked me to talk about my experience the last week of my mom's life. Oh, wow. And I, I was gonna, I thought about her the other night. I'm like, can you say, I would love the footage. I'd like to see it. I'd like to hear, hear my story because I stayed, I've stayed with her the last week and it was quite amazing in a weird kind of, I've never done this. I hope I never do this again type of thing. But we were so connected that I actually put a post out on Facebook. I said, anyone who knows my mom or ever has heard of my mom, because people would say, I love how you talk about her. Like I would always be like me and my mom did this. And she, this is what I learned from her today, even as a full blown adult. Right. <laughs> and they're like, it's so amazing. This connection you have with your mom and what you, you continue to like, just like, just honor her. Yeah. And so I did this post on Facebook and I literally said, anyone who knows my mom, I had been talking to her. I started medicating her heavily on morphine and knowing this is, she's aging. This is it. This is the last yeah. of it. 
And so I'd been talking to her like day in and day out for days <laughs> and like, there's no response. Right. So it's just yeah. like, I'm entertaining myself talking about things that we did as kids. And so I said, anybody who has anything to say about my mom, I would love for you to post it or share with me, send me a text, something I'm going to read them all to her. Oh, that's cool. So I actually, uh, yes, I know it's cool. Right. Um, she, I was able to almost do her eulogy while she could still hear me. Oh, wow. And that's pretty cool. And some of them were hard. Like I would cry through it and I take a deep breath, but I found, and then people called and I let them talk to her, like put the phone up to her. It was so cool. And I know she heard it. And I actually gave those people an opportunity to share their words. So I'd be like, mom, remember Cindy? Remember my neighbor from the, in that Betty Lou Lane in Tahanga? And I go, she has this to say about you, blah, 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 right? And it was just the coolest thing. That's and awesome. some of the nurses would just be like standing there bawling. <laughs> bawling. <laughs> and then like, we're so, still very good friends with a lot of the people, the nurses, because yeah. I spent so much time there. Um, but I'll be brief, but right after... Um, I actually was there for a whole week and I remember the hospice doctor came in and he goes, you know, I just want to tell you something. Sometimes parents don't like to do everything in front of their child. And this might be one of them. And so somebody else came in and said, why don't you go? It's, you would probably have like five more hours. Why don't you go home, take a shower, grab a bite to eat and come back. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to take the last of these few things. Like I had an infuser and I think I had like, you know, music or whatever, a couple candles yeah. or something. I'm just going to take these things with me. And I start walking out to my car with every intention of coming home and coming right back. And right as I was leaving, it was kind of, it was February 12th. So it was a little like misty outside. And this young, I'll call him young, he was probably 20 something. He was wearing a hoodie. And he says, he says, you should put your hood on. You're going to catch a cold. And I'm mom. I looked at him like mom just passed because there's no way that 20 year old boy was telling me to put a, a hat on a hood over my head. So I didn't catch a cold. That wow. was my mom. And I'm like, she just passed. She waited the minute till I let that I left the room. So sure enough, I get, I just, I was only four miles away. I get a phone call saying she just passed. I go, I knew it because she sent me a message to that kid that's standing outside. Isn't that amazing? It was so bizarre. It's but amazing it. how that works. Yeah. He literally was like, you need to put, you know, and I'm like, there is You probably no didn't way. even know what you could have went up to him and asked him and he probably maybe not even known what he no, said. No, no, I don't think he did. Yeah. And then I was just like, that was incredible. That was incredible. That is so cool. That's a cool story. It's Thanks for cool. sharing that. Yeah. It's cool. Because it tells you that there's there's power in us as humans. Connection. That we can't comprehend. Yeah. There's power in connection. Yeah. And when and you, that's why it, humans matter, right? So <laughs> let's not switch to robots. <laughs> exactly. And connection in the workplace and connection. And everything you do is going to make a difference in your life. And Absolutely. whether it's your family member and like, you know, yeah, I was just thinking like when my dad passed, there were some friends of mine that were engineers and they're like, you know, I don't talk to my parents. And I'm like, why? Like my dad was just killed by a drunk driver. I can't say goodbye. And I would tell him like my feelings, like, I wish I could tell my dad this, this, and this, and that you can. Call yeah. your parents. You don't have yeah. to, you don't have to love and adore them, but just like share for you, do it for you. Yeah, and you know, absolutely. till this day, he tells me you changed my life just That's by awesome. sharing how you felt about not being able to say goodbye to your dad, which might be I, why I did such amazing with my mom. Like I was just all over that, you know, you totally should. I think I really think Jeannie, you should leverage your human resources experience and 
leverage these experiences as being a mom, your mom's passing these stories and really go help parents. Cause I think parents are struggling today. Like everyone struggles in a lot yeah. of areas. The world is way more complex than we ever would have thought even just three years ago. And people are dealing with crap. Like I got five kids. Some of the, your stories and your perspectives would be valuable for, to share with my wife. And so I'm going to show her this episode, but you could definitely really help some parents in connecting with their kids and making a meaningful difference as a parent role. Yeah, I think you're right. My son can, um, the relationship that we have is like proof right there. And yeah. I used to laugh. I'd be like, he's a five-year-old boy going on a 45-year-old woman because he was so <laughs> wise. And he like grew up in my office listening to me coach people, leaders about their mindset and their shift and how they should communicate. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, he's still, he's, he's going to be 12 in um, next month, September, but he is wise, way more wise beyond, beyond his years. And I was the same, but I think it's simply because there was a parent who, oh, now it's hard when you have five. And again, I was the youngest of six. So they were all kind of doing their thing. And my mom's like, I'm not going to screw this one up. No, I'm just <laughs> um, She's like, I got one more shot. I'll get one, right on the sixth one. One, <laughs> one more. Um, I think just you hit it. Just listen and listen, be there for them. And if you have yeah. five kids, devote a certain amount of time, even if it's just 10 minutes. Hey, this is your time from, you know, 610 to 620, I'm all yours. What do you want? What do you want to do? Yeah, and if they want to play darts or if they want to color or if they want to talk or they want to just, I don't know, hug you and not say anything. I remember crawling up on my mom. I tell my son this story all the time, just hugging her, not as an adult, but hugging her. And she'd be like, what's wrong? I don't know. She goes, sometimes we don't know, but just embrace, sit here. Let's just sit here and get through this, you know? That's cool. So I always tell him that too, all the time. If you want me to just sit with you. I'm here. I tell my friends that too. Like, you're not alone. I will walk this road with you. I will stand there. And there's been, I'm going to cry. There's been times where I've gone to help people and I'm like, you don't have to say anything or you can say everything. Uh, a dear friend of mine passed away in January and he was fairly young. And I asked his wife if she wanted to go for a walk with me. And we have a lake here, five miles around Lake Miramar. And I said, you can talk, you can tell me anything you want. You can ask me anything. Or we cannot say a word for five miles, whatever you want to do, because she just needed someone. Yeah, she just needed another person to to make her feel validated, to make her yes. experience validated, to help yes. her feel loved and appreciated. That's what people need. People <clears throat> are all going through things, but they need someone to, whether you talk or not talk, to let them know they matter. And that you care about them. And I want to add awesome. one thing because even strong people, strong or successful people need a, need to feel they're cared, like they, yeah. that you care about them, check on them. And I, I've been sharing this with my friends. I go, no one checks on me. Like I check on everybody. No, he's checking on me. I'm just telling you, you know, we all need to be checked on. So even if you have that best friend, who's a CEO, check on her, check on him because yeah. you just never know. Yeah. You know, and just be there. Hey, just thinking about you. That goes a long way. Like, I'm oh, totally. just thinking about you. Is everything cool? Like, I, I will periodically check. I have this group of people. You good? They're like, good. I'm like, thumbs up. That's it. Took like two seconds. Yeah. I just, they need to know that I'm thinking about them and I care and I'm here if they need me. I really like what you're doing. I like your personality. I like your experience. You are a pleasure to talk to you. You definitely are a professional, a seasoned human being who has a lot of wisdom. And thank you for sharing all of that on this episode. Thank you so much. I really, really, truly enjoyed it. And I didn't just say that you, this was my most enjoyable podcast. Well, thank you. That means a lot. I'm doing the best I can and I'm just putting my best foot foot out there and I'm just, you know, I'm along for the journey. <laughs> I, I have it. no idea where this will go. No, but, I think it's great. Yeah, I just want to help people, you know, and so that's why, because a lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are having issues with where to even go to achieve success, what success means to them. Some people are, you know, confused that it means money only, but it is so much, you know, and success. just stuff like this is helpful. Yeah, it has to come from within. You have to identify what it is and you have to feel it. That's the yeah. only person that matters. If you're feeling successful at what you're doing, think about the artists. Remember the starving artists? Yeah. They loved what they were doing. They were successful. Money wasn't the, 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 win, the win in that. 
right? Because we matter and we need to recognize that. We matter Your, and everybody matters. Everyone matters. All of our individual dreams and visions matter to you. And we need to learn how to think about that. And also helping others helps you achieve those too, because, you know, you share the love, you get love back and it's just, it's karma. It's universal. And Absolutely. It, it's amazing to me how true that is in so many aspects, but thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Yeah. This was a very good conversation. Very, very insightful. I think we had a, a a lot of good connection points and then a lot of, a lot of wisdom. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome. Okay. Where do people go to book you? What's your site? Um, so on uh, dynamism leadership, so it's D Y N A M I S M leadership.com. They can actually, you can book a call from the site and you can find out all the information about the company and what we offer right there. There's also links to all the socials. If you want to connect. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We'll keep in touch. Absolutely. 